Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, this is sorry, this is the last of the Kelly Writers series of Kelly Writers House Fellows events featuring Nathaniel Mackey, and so this gives us a chance to start. And of course, we'll do it at the end too to um, not just thank Nate, but praise him, which is totally due given the brilliance of the work and the longevity of his commitment to you know a bunch of the issues that will be topics and contentions that we'll be talking about this morning. So could you help me by th uh, putting your hands together and thanking Nate Mackey. For <laughs> so Lily Applebaum, who is the coordinator of the Writers House Fellows program and is, I, don't, I always say amazing or the best, or I'm sorry, Lily, I'm running out of adjectives, but you know, no one does this better. It's just so amazing how smoothly the thing flows because she cares about every detail and she cares about the writing and she cares about the art. So can we thank and praise Lily Applebaum? <laughs> So we're going to go an hour and maybe an hour and five minutes or so. Um, and I have three questions or topics to bring up at the beginning. And then I'm going to, and then Lily has a portable mic. And that will be an opportunity for you to, um, if, you, if you don't mind, stand up and ask a question. It's OK to do it from your seat. But it's a little easier for us up here if you stand. And um, you know, ask a question. Maybe it's in the flow of what we've been talking about. Or maybe you just want to say something in response to Nate's work. That would be good, too. Um, and then toward the end, um, I, have a, I have a question I've already told Nate about, um, which um, ties it back to what we've been trying to do here at the Writer's House. And it turns out that Mike McGee, uh, who is, a, a, in my life at least, early Nate Mackey reader, fan, mm -hmm. avatar, advocate, uh, and a fine poet and editor in his own right, who was a founder of the Writer's House, one of the founders back in the mid-'90s, he kept pushing Bedouin Hornbook ideas on us at the founding of the Writer's House. And it turns out there's a passage in there that I would call um, an ars pedagogica or ar ars institutional aesthetic uh, uh, that uh, I, th I was going to ask you uh, to read at the end as a way of sort of connecting us okay. and our ideas about community. So, um, yeah, so before I ask the first question, I just want to say that we have copies of books uh, for sale. And Nate will be here at this table for a little bit after the session so he can inscribe it for you. So volumes one through three of From a Broken Bottle, Traces of Perfume Still Emanate. Uh, and th this is a beautiful edition. Uh, this is a, a New Directions edition and it's available. Uh, Splay Anthem, which won the National Book Award, that teeny weeny insignificant prize that's <laughs> given to one book, Splay Anthem. And this is, I mean, with all due respect to the earlier work of the two intertwined, this is the sort of big intertwining of them, the two ongoing poems. This is where you might start before you go back and then forward. Sorry, I editorialized that, but I think it's a great way to do it. Blue Fossa, which is the most uh, recent of the paperback, there have been some chapbooks, but the most recent book of poems. Um, this is also available. And most importantly, maybe, because it's just out, Late Arcade, which is, which is yes. the volume yes. of From a Broken Bottle. And um, somewhere in there uh, this morning, I'm going to ask Nate to read a couple of pages of, um, of, of one of N's improvs, uh, just to give you a sense partly of how amazing it is to be writing about made up improv solos. <laughs> so. Please um, buy a copy. We ran out of the um, broadsides, but we have all these. Okay. So Nate, I wanted to just partly by way of plugging a great uh, literary mentor and influencer of you, uh, and partly to ask a question about this book by Wilson Harris, which probably many people in the room have read. It's a fundamental book, Palace of the Peacocks. It's his, I don't know if it's his actually his first novel, but the people say it's his first novel. Uh, it, it's the first that he uh, allowed to be published. It's the one that he considers the beginning of his yeah. work. He, he, yeah. he wrote uh, two novels before that, yeah. but uh, he destroyed both manuscripts. And this really is an, a, a crazy beginning, uh, published in 1960, and the editor at Faber was T.S. Eliot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, go Eliot. <laughs> um, well, I was, I read this in grad school, but I reread it while I was reading Nodhaus. And I just want to quote a couple of lines from it and then ask you how, what, what 
how much Wilson Harris is in the back of you as you write. Um, you know, here's T.S. Eliot, who supposedly kind of lo helped launch the anti-realist, you know, uh, modernist thing. Reading this, just imagine. Here's a line. Uh, in this remarkable filtered light, it was not men of vain flesh and blood I saw, toiling laboriously and meaninglessly, but active ghosts whose labor was indeed a flitting shadow over their shoulders as living men would don raiment and cast it off in turn to fulfill the simplest necessity of being. Mm -hmm. When I saw that he delayed the subject of that line, I, mm -hmm. and the verb saw, mm -hmm. and threw in a couple of verbs to be, mm -hmm. I thought, I'm reading Nodhouse. <laughs> I thought, oh my God. And one more, Nate, before we talk about Wilson and Harris. Um, this is Dunn, D-O-N-N-E, -N -N -E, who's sort of the, sort of the Conradian Marlowe sort of type, who's taking the group down the river. This is a Gnostic heart of darkness, I guess. Now I'm a, I'm a man, I've learned, to rule this. This is the ultimate. We don't know what this is, right? This is everlasting. One doesn't have to see deeper than that, does one? He stared at me hard as death. That's done. <laughs> Rule the land, he said, while you still have a ghost of a chance. Mm -hmm. And he uses ghost of a chance about six times in this book. Yeah. So I'm reading Ghost of a Trance. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about the relationship? It's, uh, it's amazing. All that ghostliness and Gnosticism. Yeah, well, um, I read Palace of the Peacock in around 1974. Um, a fellow who had been a student of Wilson Harris is when he taught at the University of Texas. Um, you know, knew that I was in, getting interested, more interested in Caribbean literature. And he said, you got to read this guy. And so I read Palace of the Peacock and immediately became, you know, uh, a student of, of Harris's work. I just read everything of his I could get my hands on. So certainly the, um, uh, you know, the veer away from, you know, a certain kind of realism uh, was one of the things that struck me, but but also um, the language, um, the you know he was he's a poet turned novelist. The novels are very short and and compressed, um, and um, his um, his way with with tax um, really struck me. Uh, so it was both um, style and and content that that uh, that drew me in. Yeah. And he became, you know, really, um, you know, one, you know, one, one of my major influences. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, when I first started re reading you, I thought that uh, the Jamesian, Henry Jamesian, it was in the background there. That kind of deliberately ambiguous reference to everything. Mm -hmm. And then I read, reread Wilson. And I realized that that's the it, um, and the iterativity. Uh, I went ghost of a trance may or may not be specifically a response to Wilson Harris's influence on you. Well, th you know, that's, that's one of those um, serendipitous intersections that, that interests me and, and, and drives a lot of stuff that you find in my work. Yeah. Uh, a Ghost of a Chance is an old uh, jazz tune, or it's an old, I think, uh, Ten Pan Alley uh, song yeah. that, uh, you know, the jazz people took over. So, um, you know, I, I had heard that uh, phrase uh, qu quite often uh, in listening to music, and so then to to uh, find it in his work, which I also found very musical, yeah. and to be a work that is in many ways about music. Um, one of the, one of the characters who ends up being the one of the chief characters and kind of an antithesis to Dunn, who represents this rapacious imperial will, and when he's saying rule it, he means rule the land, as yeah. he says. Yeah. Um, but the counterpoint to, to Dunn is, is Carol, uh, whose name suggests his activity. You know, he sings. He's a singer. Mm. And he, in a way, has the, the last word in the novel. It's, it's uh, Carol's singing out of uh, these various windows in the wall of this cliff waterfall uh, uh, after death, it would have seemed, or even after a second death, right. it's not. It's not entirely clear, right. but um, it's his. Um, it's his caroling that um, 
that 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 um, Harris takes the, the novel out on. Yes. So you know, and I found it's very much a you know his prose is very much a poet's prose. Yeah. Very much musical yeah. uh, in that way, and so it was. Um, you know, the book itself is musical. The book itself is is making certain propositions, I think, implicit and explicit about music. And uh, and then it was intersecting with this this music that I listened to and that, that has been such a big force in my life, uh, yeah. jazz, you know, Ghost of a Chance. You know, I don't stand a ghost of a chance with right. you. Right, um, right, right. So, um, in fact, the title, I think that the title Ghost of a Trance, I stole. There's a, a set of of uh, Anthony Braxton recordings made at the Iridium. It's like a 10 CD package that was put out by uh, Firehouse Records, and uh, a number of people were at, were asked to attend those um, those 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 get those nights at the Iridium and uh, uh, write liner notes. Yeah. And I believe that one of the one of the one of the liner notes uh, I've forgotten the author, but I believe it's called. Uh, ghost of a trance, right. because uh, Braxton at that time was calling his 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 music the um, I think he was calling it ghost trance mm. music. Mm. So um, so you can see that it's you know right. um, I had no chance. You know? <laughs> I, mean, I mean that just but also um, I, I was a sitting duck for all that stuff. But also ch chance suggests to a realist or a rationalist probability meaning something we can do if we do it right. Mm -hmm. uh, but ghost of a chance, it suggests the um, invisible uh, downside or underside of that kind of rationality. Mm -hmm. um, and in Ghost of a Trance, there's this key moment where Braxton gets mentioned, and it connects to me to the Wilson Harris idea. Uh, p someone calls the speaker a pilgrim. And the speaker says no at first, and then he says yes, and then Brax is on the box, <laughs> which suggests that pilgrimage, wherever it is, I mean, whatever, whatever heart of Amazonian darkness, these guys, it's a non-objective reality that you're interested in there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I wonder if you would just, in the spirit of Brax and Harris, read the first couple of sections of Ghost of a Trance for us. Okay. Maybe this one, this one, and that one. Okay. Thank you. This is from Nod House. Gray morning, blue morning, a feather blown between, mashed earth incumbent, gone up from, never more naked if ever to be naked, brink what it was to be on. Where next we came, stick figure people greeted us. Abstract was abstract, also something else. Line, shape, extension, each other than itself. Of number, we'd have said the same. Aspect arrested us, riveted we stood. Stick figure epiphany held us in our tracks, everyone's bones in full view. Gray morning, blue morning. An unheard string between, bad heads mourning reluctance, ennui's next day dispatch. We were chill, shiver, exegetic sweat, backed up interpreters put upon by slough. None of us could say what was what. Pale admonishment poised upon lack, like to unlike, pale strain recumbent, recombinant, ruled amniotic straw. Took leave, leave long since taken, awoke to what would otherwise not have been. We contested birth. We wanted to be pre ondumbuluus done dead Gnostics again. Sound bubbled up. It kept bubbling. Sonic residue, sonic remit. A fickle sonnets, fraught sonnets, warning we knew nothing Stick figure entourage, otherwise issueless, beginning to be remiss, it seemed. Erstwhile ecstatics lapsed enchantment, trance gone, none could say since when. Ghost of what lifted us, ghost what lifted us, erstwhile enchantment between. Fell back, full out extended, 
Pilgrim, someone called me. I said no, then I said yes. Brax was on the box, was what it was, toned uncertainty. Stick figure council, all air, edge, angle, down from where we'd been, and we were again where the alone lived. Adage, had it not been so abstract, it might have been. Long day of the abalone shell sunset. Stood among redwoods expecting the worst. What was of note and what abjured nothing? What was all, none, one, all the same? It was the ghost of a trance. I was a guest of the trance. What went on, we blamed on the ghost. It was the ghost of a trance, each of us a guest of the trance. No two times were the same. When we hit a wrong note, we said nothing. When we hit the right note, we said, so what? Tell my horse, we were told, fluke solace horse we were mounted by. What was done was done by the ghost. Gray morning, blue morning, eternity between. That's Ghost of a Trance from Nodhouse. At, at the risk of being too much of a uh, busybody critic, <laughs> can you say a little more about why Brax being on the box allowed the speaker to say, yeah, I am a pilgrim. Um, because um, Braxton's music is is, is exploratory. Uh, it is essentially um, an unending serial work. Uh, every every composition is a part of that ongoing work, and even um, uh, every composition has within it. Um, a theoretically number, numberless or infinite um, uh, possibilities of, of execution. He leaves it that loose. So um, that music makes one a pilgrim. I mean, you, you, you listen to it and you are recruited into a voyage, a migration, uh, the kind of exploration that, that uh, Braxton himself is on. So, you know, that's you know, that's, that's what I was getting at with that. Uh, first I said no, and then I said yes. Uh, Damn. Brax will take you there. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. Um, okay. So I want to, the second of the three questions I want to ask before we get to the portable mic uh, is about quoting. Oh, but it, oh there was also a more yep. personal. One of the yep. pieces in, in, uh, in that box set is dedicated to me. So um, uh, it was also... You know, um, Braxton. You know, specifically recruiting me mm. <laughs> onto yeah. that onto that train. You felt summoned. I felt summoned. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, and that's really good. And, yeah. and um, how about multi instrumentality, which is you know Braxton's signature, and of course that's something that your N mm -hmm. and and his colleagues are into. But but frankly, you like the word intermedia in describing Wilson Harris's work because he's interested in the visual. You're interested in music. Mm -hmm. I don't know another poet in the scene right now who's more uh, devoted to the inter-arts analogy, the power of in multi-instrumentality. Is that mm -hmm. over-reading? No, no, no. That's a word I use pointedly uh, to describe um, N. He's a, you know, he's a composer, multi-instrumentalist, I yeah. always say. And, and, and in that, I'm, I'm, I'm in influenced by, um, you know, the move that many of the musicians made um, what you might call the post Coltrane generation, mm -hmm. where um, I think it was partly out of a sense that, um, I mean, if you were a tenor saxophone player, um, so many definitive stamps had been pl placed on the way you could play tenor, uh, you know, culminating in Coltrane. And it was difficult to feel, you know, that y you had anything new to add. And I think that um, one of the reasons that uh, people like uh, Roscoe Mitchell and Joseph Jarman and Braxton himself became multi-instrumentalist is uh, because of that. You could, you know, you you you, um, you know, it, it was difficult to take just one instrument and go much farther than yeah. uh, had been gone with yeah. it. And so yeah. um, 
one extended one's uh, one extended one's palette, widened one's palette yeah. by having a whole range of instruments right. that one played. Yeah. So for 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 people here who listen to this who want to find a way into Nate Mackey's work, I think multi instrumentality in the widest sense is one one approach, one avenue. Um, I just want to move over to other. I think a lot of us who were, uh, uh, at the time you published it, were thinking about otherness, understanding otherness theoretically, and in the politics of race, found other, your essay, which was in representations, you mm -hmm. told me last yeah. night, yeah. Uh, to be astounding. And in the middle of it, you quote Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God in a way that just, you know, just puts puts a point to the whole thing. And I wondered if you would read the passage and I mean, we could talk about its importance to you in the whole problem of the other. You've been, this is, this is using other as a case for the politics of the avant-garde. Uh, variational writing has a politics, mm -hmm. I would say. So do you mind reading that? Yeah, this is from um, Hurston's, probably her best known work, her novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God which I think was published in, what, 1937 or something like that? 38? Yeah, it's yeah, anyway. 30s, certainly. 30s, certainly. Um, and she's um, talking about um, the inhabitants of this black community in Florida, you know, probably Edenville. I don't know if she ever named it Edenville, but, uh, you know, certainly modeled on, um, you know, communities that she knew and that community that she knew. Um, but one of the things that Hurston's doing in, in the book is um, um, giving us both a picture and some analysis of, 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 of black uh, folk culture, black oral culture. And she talks about the, the gossipers and the storytellers that sit on the porch, which is kind of like the, uh, the heart of, the, of this town. And they gather there after work and so on. And um, she's especially uh, interested in that dialectic between uh, the space of work and the space of this, she wasn't calling it that, spoke, but it was, the, the space of this spoken word. Um, and she says, it was the time for sitting on porches beside the road. It was the time to hear things and talk. These sitters had been tongueless, earless, eyeless conveniences all day long. Mules and other brutes had occupied their skins. But now the son and the boss man were gone, so the skins felt powerful and human. They became lords of sounds and lesser things. They passed nations through their mouths. That last line is yeah. so important to you, isn't it? Yeah, well, the, it's... Um, it's what your work does. Yeah, it's it's you know it's it's a it's a kind of enablement. It's kind of a, a empowerment. Uh, it's a kind of um, you know it's a it's a way of reclaiming their 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 humanness, their humanity. Like she says, uh, earlier in the day, they'd just been uh, conveniences, um, you know, for the boss man, and here they um, they become lords of the world. They they are um, they exercise uh, you know their power, uh, which is which is verbal. Uh, which, which resides in um, gossip, uh, with storytelling, jokes. And maybe just noises, lesser things? Sounds uh, and lesser things? Uh, she's specifically talking about uh, words, mm -hmm. language. Yeah. Uh, she's, I mean, one can extend that, and I do extend it, yeah. to, to nonverbal uh, performance. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what, what gets done with, with a piano or what gets done with a trumpet, where the... You know the speech-like qualities are very definitive of of of, of a particularly African American approach to, uh, to instrumental music. Uh, yeah. Eric Dolphy talking about um, well, I, I you know I try to speak when I play the horn, and and right. Mingus, who a bass player, saying uh, yeah we did that. You know we talked to each other uh, when we um, when we performed. And there's a wonderful um, uh, cut on a Mingus album. I think it's called What Love. And they and, and Mingus and Dolphy get into a, a dialogue, bass and uh, and bass clarinet, and it's, it's it sounds very conversational, even argumentative at points. Uh, Dolphy was about to leave the band, 
and Mingus wasn't entirely happy about that. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, it sounds like Mingus is cussing him out, and Dolphy is squawking back, defending himself. It's, it's a riot. I, I, I recommend it. But, but this idea of, of um, you know, they, they, take the, um, they take the world in, and they pass it back out in what they, in what they say about it. So, um, you know, they're not just passive, voiceless, um, you know, uh, um, appliances in the world. You know, they actually have voices, they have perspectives, they have thoughts about the world uh, that, they, um, that they pass along, uh, pass around with one another. It reminds me of um, something that uh, George Lamming, a uh, West Indian novelist uh, out of Barbados, uh, his first novel is, is called In the Castle of My Skin. And it's very much a, a portrait of a of a village in the same of a black village in the same way that that uh, Hurston's is. It's a village in in uh, in Barbados in the West Indies, and in commenting about, um, uh, Lamming went so far as to say that the real protagonist of that novel is the village, <clears throat> is that community, and he said uh, um, he said um, he said about them. He says that the word. And he doesn't mean the Bible. He, he just means, you know, verbal arts. He said the word is their only rescue. The word is their one rescue. Mm -hmm. and, and that sense of, um, you know, uh, people in the, the African diaspora um, having that, if no other recourse, to fall back on. Um, language, um, storying, um, telling, the kinds of things that, and stretching the language altering the language, othering the language. Yeah. I mean, so much slang in, um, in, in, in U.S. Um, you know, uh, verbal culture you know, comes out of black communities. Um, that's not an accident. I mean, it's, 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 the, uh, it's the treating of the given language as simply given uh, that has no claims to uh, inevitable validity, truth, eternity, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, it's just the beginning, just like a, a Tin Pan Alley tune for a bebopper is just the beginning. You don't just play the melody. You know, you take it apart, you look at the chord changes, and you do all these variations on it. So this othering, which is a, a very radical art of variation, is, uh, you know, is, is there in what, um, in what Hurston is, is, is pointing out. Um, you know, the way in which, um, <laughs> for example, um, the story of Noah and the Ark um, gets torqued in a certain way uh, in one of the tales that she, that she um, talks about in Mules and Men. No Noah is, is called Nora, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and the, that story turns into a story about a woodpecker who keeps pecking on the wood of the, of the ark. And, um, and that's, of course, very dangerous when you're out in sea. You know, you get holes in the, in the hull of the ship, and the ship sinks. And so Nora uh, has to lock up uh, the woodpecker um, so that the woodpecker won't, won't peck away at the hull. Now, in, um, you know, in, in, in southern black uh, communities, woodpecker, um, you know, is an epithet uh, easily exchangeable with, with pecker wood. Uh, right. For white people, right. so this becomes this uh, you know um, you know coded but not all that coded way of talking about uh, you know um, you know the, the white woodpecker as a threat to the world. I mean, you know the uh, <laughs> and one of the tellers of this story says, you know, uh, you know, I just hate them woodpeckers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just hate them. Every time I see one of them, I just want to take my shotgun out and shoot it. You know, uh, you know, the nerve of those, those that woodpecker. You know, uh, you know, almost killed me before I was even born. You know. <laughs> in other, in the essay, you're worried that otherness will too quickly become a noun. And you say other is something people do, mm -hmm. and this and Hurston is an example of a writer who's not simply writing about otherness, but is othering the language. You, mm -hmm. you said that, but this is um, such a crucial part 
of your work and a challenge to the poetic and musical avant-garde to continue a variational improvisational style which you describe as a divergence from the given, mm -hmm. given being conventional assumptions including political and racist assumptions. So uh, it's a political thing to be avant-garde is something you've said implied yeah. for years yeah. and years. Yeah. Well, what I was saying yesterday, I mean, if you, you know, if you're seen in, uh, as other, I mean, you're already political. I mean, if you, if you act in any way that diverges from, um, you know, the uh, position and the characterization that has been allotted you, right. you know. So if you, um, you know, if, if you come on like Braxton and say, well, yeah, I've got something to say about opera, you know. Mm. I mean, it's very political for, you know, uh, for, for a black musician, you know, to step outside of what is considered his place. Uh, Duke Ellington, when he started writing those suites and those longer compositions, um, that was not met with, with universal approval. I mean, there were, there, were, there were critics who thought that he was getting, he was being, you know, he was pretentious, you know. Um, you know, these suites and extended compositions and that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, stay within your, 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 three, your three minutes, two and a half minutes, you know, and be happy with that, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, he was demanding more time and space, which we know is, is the allotment of time and space is, is already political. And your devotion to the long song and the long poem is political in the sense of uh, saying that the phanopoetic lyric moment of revelation is not the only way to write. Right, you know, yeah. And like I said yesterday, you know, one of the things I remember from, you know, from church when I was a kid was those those very um, high <laughs> special moments when someone would say, take your time. Take your time. Take your time, son. <laughs> you know? So I just keep hearing this voice saying, take your time. And, you know. I, I was going to ask you to read from late, uh, late arcade, but I think I want to turn to the audience because I know people have questions. And I know we're going to come back certainly at the end to look at that, what I described as um, Ars Pedagogica. But before that, I would love to hear some of your questions. So it takes a little bravery to be the first, but please be brave. Davey, over there. Morning, Davey. <laughs> Do you mind standing good so morning, we can Al. see? Good morning, Nate. Hello, Davey. How are you? Hey, how are you? I'm uh, good. Davey you. ran five miles already this morning. So. Thanks, Al. Putting I'm, tired, I'm tired just thinking about that. Yeah, seriously. Me too. Thanks, Al. So thinking about curating time and space, one of the ways that it's been helpful to, for me to think about your work is as music curating time and space. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the way that music in your work is both a kind of place and a way to make a place, and also a way to get there. So how is music a mode of travel in your poems? How do you think about that? And how is music a way of taking up space or allotting place making for yourself as well as time? Well, it, it, it's, um, you know, music is one of the ways that people who uh, are confined to very, con, you know, con, constricted spaces have found ways to uh, give themselves more space, and I would say more time as well. Um, you know, um, it's not an accident that you have someone like Bob Marley um, taking a line from the Bible, you know, I'm going to... I'm going to prepare a place. And that music is the preparation of that place. That's a, that's a bigger place. It's a more capacious, uh, a more welcoming place uh, than is otherwise available. And you know, music has had that, you know, that, that, that function, in, certainly in the black diaspora and other tra tra uh, traditions as well. Uh, Graham Locke uh, wrote a book on um, Sun Ra, Anthony Braxton, and Duke Ellington, especially their work in extended poem, in ex poems, in extended forms, you know, what I call the long song. Um, and he calls the book a Blutopia, which is a title and a neologism that he takes from Duke Ellington. So, I mean, that pretty much gives it away, you know? I mean, Ellington is, is, uh, is calling his music Blutopia. I mean, so it's this expanded, you know, um, Expanded space, uh, this you know that 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 um, contrasts pretty dramatically, you know, with the you know constricted spaces that have uh, just 
recurred and reverberated throughout African American uh, history and cultural uh, performances. I mean, you think about the tradition of uh, these contracted spaces, these tight spaces. I mean, you think about um, uh, Bigger Thomas's apartment in Native Son. I mean, that's, that's descended from the garret that uh, Harriet Wilson hides out in, in her, in her uh, uh, story, uh, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. And then there's, um, what was his name? Henry Box Brown, who, you know, who, who, who sh- yeah, who, who, who mailed himself to Philadelphia mm-hmm. <laughs> in a box. So, I mean, we've got, we've got all these traditions of, of um, you know, th- this stingily allotted space, you know, for, uh, for African diasporic folks. Limbo is one of them, too. Limbo is one of them, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't, I, you know, yeah. I mean, this ability to negotiate, um, you know, a, a, a tighter and tighter space going under the limbo bar. And the, and the tradition in the, in the West Indies has it that the limbo was born in the, in the holds of the slave ships, where, of course, you know, uh, you know uh, conditions were horrible and there was not much space given. I mean, they were packed in like sardines or even worse. I remember hearing um, Sun Ra's orchestra um, with, uh, in, in New York uh, back in the 60s. He was playing, it's kind of the house band at a place uh, in the, what they call the far east side, um, <laughs> at a place called Slugs. And I remember uh, going to hear him one night. And it was kind of amazing because um, the stage you know, it was really not much bigger than this space that we have here. Yeah. And he had like a 22-piece orchestra, <laughs> you know? And they were spilling out of, off the stage onto the, <laughs> you know, onto the, into the, you know, the, the, the place where the, you know, uh, tables and chairs were. And it just seemed to me a very graphic illustration of um, this confined, inadequate space that, um, that um, you know, an artist like Sun Ra you know, has, to, has to put up with. There's a reason he talks about space. There's a reason he talks about outer space. There's a reason he talks about being from Saturn. You know, he's talking about an alternate space that is more capacious, that is more welcoming, wow. you know, that, um, that makes room for him and that 22-piece orchestra. And he, and he, and he, you know, he emphasized the orchestra, it's an arc. You know, it's 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 uh, back to it's Nora, back to Nora, and back to you know survival. You know? Wow, David, how was that answer your question? <laughs> Jesus, Nate. Okay, while he's on a roll, let's get another question. <laughs> Who's oh, Jack, yeah. and then Amber Rose. Morning, Jack. Al, uh, Katie Price isn't here, is she? No, yeah. she's not here today. No. Okay. Well, I just yeah. wanted to give her a shout out because. I helped her build Nate's uh, Electronic Poetry Center page. Yes, and thank you, Jack, ago. for that. I don't wanna, no, no, Katie did 95% of the work. Okay. So, you know, Shout out to Katie, wherever you are. But I wanted to ask, it, and this question may reflect nothing more than my ignorance of the full extent of your work, but apart from your use of jazz and other musics in your poetry, uh, have you written more or less straightforward essays about jazz? I've written essays that, that certainly include references to jazz, um, how straightforward they are. Uh, <laughs> I don't think Nate's ever written anything straightforward. <laughs> yeah, but well, there, I would recommend Late Arcade, actually. Uh, yeah, I mean, all, right? all, these, That's jazz. All, five, all five volumes are about jazz, but I mean, I wrote an essay on uh, Miles Davis called um, Blue and Green, uh, Black interiority, talking about uh, Miles' sound. I, I, I wrote that for a, uh, a Miles Davis conference that uh, it's in St. Louis, um, and it's in it's in Paracritical Hinge. Um, I wrote about uh, flamenco and uh, its uh, its impact on uh, Garcia Lorca and via Garcia Lorca on other poets, U.S. poets like. Um, Amiri uh, Baraka, Robert Duncan, um, Jack Spicer. I've forgotten who else was in there. But, um, but in the course of it, it's called um, Conte Moro, and it's also in Paracritical Hinge. And in the course of that, I talk about 
you know, Coltrane's music as, uh, as you know, having a certain quality that I think Lorca would have called Duende. And your Baraka essay, on, Baraka and Music, Baraka uh, is and on music. the title. But, yeah. And then also, Jack, I'd recommend Breath and Precarity, which can be seen at this point as a YouTube recording of a talk that Nate gave at least twice last mm -hmm. year. And I that, wrote there's the, a lot of jazz in there. Yeah. And I wrote the liner notes for um, a Steve Coleman CD called Genesis and the Opening of the Way. Um, and there's another, uh, I wrote liner notes for another anyway so i've i've written more or less directly about it but straightforward i don't i don't think of jazz itself as straightforward <laughs> i mean they play these horns that loop around and you know i mean so I try <laughs> thank you amber rose you have a question hello hello um hi um my question is um really about the place of rage in your work um, and if there is a place for rage in your work and where you find it, um, especially thinking about, um, particularly for black diasporas, how rage um, in many ways becomes an affect that sustains the long song or the long fight mm -hmm. um, and can also motivate a deep ethics of care. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the place of rage in your work? Um, well, I think, you know, rage is... Rage is there in, in every black person's life, you know, uh, all the time. Um, the, um, you know, but we find ways to um, play it in different keys, you know, in different time, time signatures. Um, you know, I'm influenced by my uncle, who when I was, when I was young and, you know, I, I would be spouting off about this and, um, and that. And he would always say, well, you know, if you let the evil and the stupidity of the world get upset you, you'll be upset all the time, you know? And, um, and I think that uh, the cultivation of cool in, in African-American uh, uh, culture, um, you know, style, uh, cultural productions, um, is tied to rage. I mean, you don't have to cool yourself off if you're not red hot. So um, the way in which, for example, um, Miles Davis as a figure of cool um, emerged in the 50s and in the 60s, unflappable. But everybody knew that you didn't mess with Miles. You know, um, He'd back you up against you know, um, a counter in a kitchen, and you'd have a knife, knife at your throat you know, before you knew it, even though you know, a few minutes before, he'd been playing this beautifully sensitive passage, you know, in My, My Funny Valentine, you know. Seemed like, the, you know, he's almost to the point of, you know, effeminacy, right? Um, so um, there was a book that came out, I've forgotten the author, Black Rage. You probably know that one. And, um, you know, I think we all, um, you know, I think we all, uh, you know, learn. One of the things we learn growing up black you know, is it, how, to, how to deal with that rage, when to express it, you know, how to express it in, in a variety of ways. Um, I think that it's really nice in some ways that other racial communities uh, are, now, are now having to experience that and, 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 uh, and learn how to do that, you know, given the present administration, where, you know, it's just, you know, they're just, I mean, reasons for rage, you know, just every five minutes, you know. Um, so, but you can't live that way, you know. I mean, you just can't, you know, you, you, you just burn yourself up, you know. So, you know, we, you know, we have, I mean, I just think about, you know, um, you know, how did, how did our ancestors um, live the absurdity of slavery, you know, for lifespans that, you know, were shorter than ours, but really, even if it was only 40 years, you know, 40 years of living that absurdity where, you know, you, you know you're a person, you know, you know you're human, and you've got to follow all these protocols that obligate you to, at least on the surface, negate your own personhood, your own, your own um, humanity. Um, you know, there was a lot of rage 
that was being managed in those situations in the interest of survival, in the interest in many cases of subterfuge, uh, in the interest of you know, an, an, uh, an insurgency that had to await its proper uh, time and occasion for expression, you know, timing, time, you know. One had to take uh, a long view. One had to see time in a much, you know, a much more expanded arena than it may be our inclination to do because, you know, we're into the sound bite and the 24-hour news cycle and everything's got to happen right now or, you know, in the next minute. But, um, you know, um, you know, you know, part of the reason that we're here is, is, is a large part of the reason that we're here is that kind of uh, endurance and ability to, um, you know, to marshal one's rage in a variety of ways and, uh, and, and among those variety of ways, one that would just, you know, feed into a mechanism that, you know, is ready to kill you you know, in the, at, the, at the least provocation or without provocation, as we see today, where, you know, um, you know all, all these black people being uh, sum summarily executed on the streets. You know, we were afraid that, we were afraid that uh, Obama might, might be assassinated, but he did, he wasn't. But, you know, that assassination took place in other kinds of ways. And he's no drama Obama. You don't think he felt rage? You know, you don't think he felt rage when, when, when somebody, uh, you know, uh, stood up in his State of the Union address and said, you lie? That was unprecedented. That had never happened before. And he had to just brush it off, you know? Um, that, you know, you don't think there's some rage in that man? And that it didn't, you know, um, have to be managed for him to do, you know, what little he was able to do, given all the forces mar marshaled against him? So, you know... Um, you know, you don't want you don't want to see all my rage. I don't think you. I don't. I, I don't. I don't think you. I don't think you want that. You know, um, my rage is channeled and sublimated, and you know, it, it comes out in you know playing with sound and playing with language, and you know, making you know subtle jabs at this or that. But it's there. You know, don't don't ever forget that. And there's the Hurstonian move of taking. Uh, making out of a kind of survivor testimony this, uh, the mouths that speak nations, such as your, the we, the traveling we, are mm -hmm. constantly doing that, feeling orphaned by yeah. language itself. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And in some ways more, you know, and more explicitly at, at times, early on, you know, and, and I think it's in What Said Seraph, one of, the, one, of the, one of the voices on the train yells out, they kill us, <laughs> you know. Mm. Um, yeah. And one of the voices, uh, in a more recent poem, you know, ask, uh, you know, why they send us off the planet so soon, you know, um, you know, it, it, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, rage has an undeniable place uh, in everybody's, I think, in everybody's situation these days. Nate, in the new book, Late Arcade, Jamila and N, who've been together since almost the beginning, mm -hmm. Um, Jamila, they're playing around, they're fooling around, and Jamila asks a question that made, what you just said made me think of. She's fooling around and she's kidding with Nate, mm -hmm. sorry, with Anne. <laughs> and she says, this is a great question, so would you rather play free jazz or be free? Now, you don't have to answer that, <laughs> Anne, Anne doesn't even answer it. Right. Is that, what kind of, I mean, she really pushes his button there. Yeah, yeah. It's not obviously it an alternative, mm -hmm. but it's a great question about, yeah. and you know, Baraka dealt with that in How You Sound way back in 1959. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that well, fun question? Well, that's, that, that's the question, I think, that, um, that haunts, you know, all avant-garde art, you know. Um, if if avant-garde art has a kind of uh, compensatory relationship um, to the uh, undesirable uh, social situation that artists find themselves in. Yeah. Um, to what extent does the uh, the bomb and the consolation offered by that art um, perpetuate those undesirable circumstances? To what extent does it um, uh, does it you know um, 
get you used to them. To, to, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a really, you know, I mean, it's a brutal question, but, you know, to what extent is survival complicity? Um, and, you know, artists face, you know, situations where, you know, they are, their, their art is a form of, uh, of, of survival, even, you know, self-medication. And, um, but I think most would argue that, you know, they would rather be free, you know, and we'll, we'll you know, you know, we'll see what happens, <laughs> you know, we'll see what happens when, you know, we'll, you know, um, I'm not so invested in, you know, the artistic moves and, you know, the artistic enjoyments, you know, that I can have um, fueled by uh, dystopic realities, rage, uh, outrage, etc. cetera. Um, you know, I'm, I'm willing as an artist, you know, to, to give utopia a chance, you know. Uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'll try it, you know, uh, serve it up. And, and uh, you know, um, if I find I no longer have anything to write about, um, you know, and no, and no longer, you know, write, um, I'll find something else to do. Baraka, in How You Sound, said, I, I, ha I want to be free, and he meant free to write in whatever way I choose, mm -hmm. free of form. And he made that essentially a civil right. Yeah, yeah. And that's, this is the so-called pre-political baraka, baraka, but in fact it's, it's, yeah, it's very yeah, political. Yeah. Isn't it? um, yeah. And he says that, <laughs> uh, he, he says that, he, he calls uh, black art, you know, sublimated murder. You know, he says that uh, Charlie Parker, if he'd just gone out and killed a few white people, could have put the horn down, you know, not play anymore. He said that Bessie Smith wouldn't have to have been doing all that bumping and grinding, you know. If, if she had just, you know, gone out and, you know, uh, killed, a few, killed a few white folks. So he was, you know, I mean, he was always thinking about that, even in the so-called, you know, non-political period. Dutchman is where, is, where, is where that happens in Clay's speech, and that's what, 1964, yeah. something like that. So Not he's long on, after the, yeah, how he, you sound. Yeah, he's, he's on his way there. But, yeah. but again, to see, um, um, but there were reactions to free jazz, you know, that, um, that made it look like, um, you know, a, a larger freedom had been ha, had been claimed. A larger freedom had, in fact, been been, been assured. He, um, you know, Baraka talks about um, buying a copy of uh, Jackie McLean's album that came out in 1960 or 62 called "Let Freedom Ring," and it's yeah. got it in big letters on you know, "Let Freedom Ring," and. Uh, and he we insist. To, also, we insist. Well, he was just talking. That's even more in, explicit. But yeah. just let freedom ring, which is you know, which is actually an American anthem. You know, I mean, that's yeah. you know, let freedom ring. Um, so, but it was uh, uh, on a jazz album, and it was being brought to the counter, you know, by this bohe this black bohemian, and he said that you know the the the, the, the white cashier, you know, looked at him very askance <laughs> and looked very uh, threatened, um, <laughs> and. Yeah. You know, and all we were talking about is, you know, um, you know, a saxophonist and a bass player, a drummer, and a piano player. <laughs> you know? How dare you? You know, you know, and a poet holding the album. But that looked, that you know, that looked, that looked threatening to, the, to, to this person. You yeah, know? exactly. Uh, we have time for one more question, and then we're going to end with Bedouin Hornbook for a little bit. And uh, can we go over here, Rachel? Do you mind? Hi. Didn't catch your name last night. Yeah, my name's Angelica, and I'm from London. And I'm an artist. Um, and you're working show. with the ICA on something. Yes. Do you mind mm -hmm. saying? Um, Just as an advertisement. Uh, the Freedom Principle exhibition at the ICA, which uh, oh. toured from um, mm -hmm. toured from uh, um, from Chicago. From Chicago, NCAA. right? And uh, I'm from a group in London called the Otolith Group, and we made a film on Don Cherry and the band Cadona for um, the Freedom Principle show mm -hmm. um, that was in MCA Chicago. It was a, a screening here, but ICA Philadelphia also just commissioned a new work by us on Julius Eastman. Great. Um, Welcome so to Philly. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to actually talk a little bit about, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, I feel like just moving to Philadelphia because of the kind of 
um, depth of um, you know something I've been familiar with for a long time, which is the kind of African American avant garde, especially in relation to music. Um, but I just wanted to kind of broaden this term of black, you know, which I did the other day in this Q and A that we were doing, and I realised that it's something to kind of keep coming back to because, of course, the African American experience is completely different to the British, um, where the kind of sense of like Afro Caribbean and Indian was kind of there was a solidarity kind of built between those groups. Um, I would say like from the end of the from the mid seventies. Um, onwards, where one identified as black if one was Indian. One was in a kind of different kind of struggle that was related, I would say, not just to um, uh, the brut well, It was related to the brutality of colonialism, but also the rights of our kind of, um, our, uh, the rights that we, you know, felt that we should have in solidarity with each other based on kind of, let's say, union struggles as well and things like that. So, of course, you know, Stuart Hall's kind of, you know, uh, vision of, you know, what difference meant in a British context, um, you know, has a kind of different bearing. Um, I wanted to just raise that. And then I was also thinking about kind of this question of resilience um, and repression. Um, how now uh, do we become more militant? Or how can we, as artists, uh, begin a kind of different form of militancy in relation to the struggle that we have now, which feels like very, you know, intense, very um, dangerous because the, of, the, of the populism of it. So it kind of calls for a kind of populist left almost. Um, so how do we participate in that? And then I was also thinking about, I was going to ask You're you a question. You're on to your third question. I know, <laughs> I was going to ask you a question about the musician as composer when the multi-instrumentalist um, has a recording studio. But we can, mm. that's another question. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> thank you for the questions. Yeah. Well, I, I was very uh, influenced by, um, heavily influenced by uh, Charles Olson's notion of composition by field open field composition. And um, one of the things that goes with that is a, a sense that um, the field of the poem is as wide as possible. Robert Duncan published a book in um, 1960 called The Opening of the Field. And I think that that, um, that less, <clears throat> that's a less, uh, focal, um, <clears throat> let, <clears throat> it's, it's less, less focal, it's, fo it's field versus focal. It's maybe um, uh, undular as opposed to particulate. So when you open up the poem and your, your artistic activity um, to a sense of field, and the field extends as you know, as widely and as far, you know, both in space and time, as you can conceive of it, then things like what's happening now, politically, are going to enter your work. Um, it just can't help it. You can't help it. It's not a question of how do we do it. It will be done. You know, I feel that happening in my own work. Uh, you know, uh, I've, I've felt myself over the last year, you know, um, you know, writing passages that I wouldn't have written two years ago. You know, once you open yourself up to being, you know, a, a receiver of what's in the field, it's going to happen. You know, your work is going to respond to it. You know, you don't need um, manifestos and, you know, symposiums to talk about it, you know, what we're going to do now. It's being done. You know, yeah, it will be done and is being done. I said at the beginning, Nate, that uh, via, via Mike McGee's advocacy of your work and a Bedouin horn book in particular, somehow the founding of the Writer's House as a space where ideally we were 
co-creating things through give and take and what you call the chorus mm -hmm. as much as possible. Um, so Bedouin Hornbook has as much of an influence as the quoted uh, Emily Dickinson uh, in the foyer where she talks about, you know, uh, what is it, for, for occupation this, with the unspecific this being the work that gets done in a room like this. There were two times when I was reading Bedouin Hornbook, and granted I was feeling pretty raw or frayed or whatever the word is you prefer, uh, two times when I actually cried in response. One is at the end when N gets arrested by the cops in L.A. and his not being near Jamila. She's mm -hmm. across town, I think. Mm -hmm. And the other is at the beginning. N's a little naive. It's an early letter. And he talks about this, the utopian prospect of a chorus of collaboration, of communitarian collaboration. And I, I just thought it would be incredibly full circle fabulous if you would read a couple of passages from that to go out today. Sure. Yeah? So I've marked it, and I kind of freaked out <laughs> while I was reading this, so forgive all my markings, but it's marked in orange there, okay. there, and then finally there. Okay. Okay. Let me see. So let me make sure I've got them right. So that one. That one. one. All the orange ones are just. Then that <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. Orange and green, Nate. And then that one okay. there. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, okay. I'll give it a try. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. So this is Nathaniel Mackey reading from Bedouin Hornbook. Okay. Um, you'll recall that I hinted at the possibility, the inevitability even, of a social solution to certain formulational blocks. What I meant to suggest was that the so-called unheard of, insisted on for so long, and most typically within the context of one or another group, that any dismantling of some such insistence likewise find its site to be a collective one. I've talked about an otherness, though it's hard to use that word anymore without wincing, about an otherness the chorus intimates. We've all heard endlessly about call and response, endless repetitions having to do with community, dialogue, so on and so forth. What I have us listen for, and hopefully hear, beneath the by now triteness of such observations, however, is a heretofore fallow reserve of poetic suggestion. It's not that we don't rightly hear call and response as both solicitation and bestowal of communal assent, nor am I suggesting the chorus not to be a, projective, a projection of sanction, a bodying forth of collective, collective accord and or insinuation. What I'm proposing is that we hear into what has up to now only been overheard, if I can put it that way, that we can awaken resources whereby, for example, assent or assent, A-S-S-E-N-T, can be heard to carry undertones or echoes of assent, A-S-C-E-N-T, accents of assent. You'll understand by this that I'm not using the word social in any flat sociological sense. What interests me is the chorus's construction of an otherwise unavailable heaven. It's more or less utopic insinuation of an accretional yes that annexes the trace of its historical locus. Have you had a chance, by the way, to listen to Streams, the piece by Cecil Taylor I recommended a while back? Any of you know that piece? We, my yeah. students okay. heard it the other day. Okay. We should, we should play it. Um, Okay, and then Zach, this other can you passage. put up streams? We can go out on it later. Can you do that, or does that mess you up? It'll mess us all up, actually. <laughs> uh, <but laughs> Cecil does not play. <laughs> but we continue. <laughs> okay. I'm intrigued by a special play back and forth between ghostliness and goad, yeah. as though the chorus thinned and also hollowed itself out to become a cavernous cloth a pall of sorts, like a muffled thru thrust of apparitional coughs. Then there's that scratchiness I've alluded to before, an almost cryptic hoarseness. This is talking about, uh, this is talking about Louis Armstrong, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, is it the age of the record, the shortcomings of early recording techniques? Or is it something more primal, something more ontic, perhaps? 
The sense I have is that we're being addressed by a barely audible witness, some receding medium so heartrendingly remote as to redefine hearing. As you yourself have so often pointed out, the frayed edges of sound are not to be heard as unheard of, however much that handle might appear to apply. The initiatic husk of self-inflicted static, or the residual hum of self-ingesting suns, call it what you will, the raspiness of Lewis's voice against the answering piercingness he gets from the horn supremely sets up the chorus to be the skinless muse it turns out to be. Socio-ethnic rub or cosmic-comic ruse. A cloak of powders might almost, a cloak of powders one might almost call it, but for the nagging question of whether his handkerchiefs contained cocaine, as some have said they did. Stardust, indeed. <laughs> this, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. The real work, though, might be to approach the chorus on a somewhat different plane, to keep ourselves clean of whatever romance of resistance would hear it only as camouflage. You bring up the possibility of taunt, a distinct quality of tease you detect in the seductive, almost dove-like smoothness we so often get from the chorus. I'm very much inclined to agree, but I can't help cautioning us against, I can't help cautioning us both against, again, overhearing rather than hearing what's there. It's like those people who used to say that Coltrane sounded like he was searching for some right note on those long runs of his that at the time were called sheets of sound. What he was up to was no such cover at all. He wanted each and every one of those notes to be heard not to be erased by the eventual arrival at some presumably correct, or at least sought after, note. Nathaniel Mackey. Well, Nate, Thank if you your goal much. in that passage was to make us a vibration society, <laughs> as you put it once, yeah. you did it. Uh, thanks again to Lily for everything you've done to make these days possible, and Zach for doing the tech. Are you bringing up uh, streams, Cecil Taylor unit? Okay. Uh, and, but most of all, and thanks for everybody for coming, and to our ICA colleagues, because you're going to give us a little sneak look at the exhibit that's coming down now, to the Writers' House Fellows students for doing this, all this work, and most of all, to Nate Mackey for spending all this time with us. One more time, Nate Mackey. All right, now, Nate didn't just recommend Angel of Dust that we hear a few minutes of Cecil Taylor unit streams. I think we should get two minutes of it halfway through, Zach, because it's pretty wild by then. So here's streams. That's this is what the chorus is supposed to do, folks. A little louder, please. Good job. Collaborate like this. Thank you again so much for coming. Nate will be here for a few minutes if you want to buy some of the books, and I very much recommend that you get a copy of Late Arcade, which just came out. Thank you again for coming. There's probably some more brunch. Appreciate it. Thank you.